Hey, it's me, Jen, again, and today we're discussing the burning question on everyone's mind. Is RFA an appropriate treatment for thyroid cancer? We'll take a deep dive on this topic with Dr. Keith Forwith, coming up. RFA for thyroid cancer. It's a topic that patients frequently ask about in our Facebook group. And unfortunately, answering patients' questions about this isn't totally straightforward or absolute. But today, Dr. Forwith is going to help us better understand the nuances of thyroid cancer and choosing the appropriate treatment option. Thyroid cancer, very complex, lots of different types, sizes, genetics. Let's talk about that and, and what is that like when you're assessing a thyroid cancer in a patient? You know, the first thing we need to start with is that um, we have to distinguish the common type of thyroid cancer, papillary thyroid cancer, from basically all others. Generally, when we think of thyroid cancer, we think of it as a less aggressive cancer. Um, and that is really true for most papillary cancers, but it is not true for any of the others. So follicular, mm -hmm. medullary, certainly anaplastic. What we're talking about today in regards to RFA needs to be that papillary thyroid cancer. All other types, not appropriate for this discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the very first thing is that we're talking about papillary. Now, papillary is very interesting in that there are some varieties of papillary cancer. And for some reason, some are way more aggressive than others. And yet there's still a large portion of those which are fairly indolent. Meaning that if you do autopsy studies, you'll see that people had papillary thyroid cancer. They died of something else and it was just found that on a post-mortem exam. Mm -hmm. So we know that papillary thyroid cancer can just sort of sit there and do nothing, but we also know that some of them can spread and can be life-threatening. Right now, we don't know exactly which ones are which, and that's where we have to be careful. Now, there are some molecular markers that we can talk about where we know, okay, this one seems like it might be a more aggressive type. Some molecular markers that say, okay, this is a little bit less aggressive but we don't have the whole picture figured out for sure. We have to realize that there is a bit of unknown in papillary thyroid cancer. Most of them behave very well. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons we get really high cure rates with papillary thyroid cancer is that they're predictable in their pattern of spread and that they're slow to spread. If you think about papillary thyroid cancer, it usually spreads first within the thyroid spreads into the central neck right underneath the thyroid, and then eventually to the lateral neck. And it usually goes to the side that it's located on. So the right goes to the right, the left goes to the left. That predictable pattern of spread gives us very high cure rates with the primary therapy, which has always been surgery. Up until now, nothing has come close to the cure rates we get with surgery. If we're thinking about a new therapy or a different kind of therapy for papillary thyroid cancer, we have to weigh it against the very good outcomes we have from surgery. Mm -hmm. So if there's something else we're gonna talk about, it better be really, really good because it's compared to something that's highly, highly affected. So mm -hmm. just get put a number on that stage one thyroid cancer that's papillary, 99.7% cure rate. I mean, that is awesome. Yes. Okay. Thyroid cancer isn't, the kind of ominous diagnosis that you might get with like lung cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer. Those are far more aggressive kinds of cancer. We don't want to think of thyroid cancer in the same vein as we think about those other seriously life-threatening cancers, but we also don't want to take it too lightly as well. So it's got to be a balance there. Definitely. Yeah. I And I appreciate you making that distinction there because I think in my beginning understanding of this about, you know, maybe a year or so ago, I, I tend to fell, fall into that camp of just thinking, it's not a big deal. Why are we making a big deal out of this? And right. I think that that might be why some patients are just so eager to do RFA because they are thinking all thyroid cancers, not just certain ones, are appropriate for this. Well, let me also throw in one more thing. Yes. You know, when we think about cancer, we, we always want to think about the possibility that this could take our life right? Mm -hmm. Any kind of cancer, we think about that. But sometimes with the good outcomes that we get with thyroid cancer, people lose sight of another factor that's super important. And the 
medical word we use for that is morbidity. But to simplify that, while it's great that someone survives, you, you also want to think about the quality of life yes. from the treatment that that generates. So I can take somebody with an early stage papillary thyroid cancer. And if I get it really early, I can take out half of their thyroid gland and they'll be cured. If I get that a little bit later, I might have to take out the entire thyroid gland and now they're on thyroid hormone every day. It has to be regulated. But if it's even later than that, we might have to take out their thyroid gland and do a neck dissection and remove lymph nodes from their neck. Now that's a much bigger operation. So if you just take those three treatment possibilities, one is about a 45 minute operation, a total thyroidectomy, maybe an hour and a half or two hours, but that removing of the gland and a neck dissection, that may be a four to six hour operation where there wow. are multiple nerves at risk and it leaves a changed neck uh, for life. And that can all be the same cancer, just depending upon what stage we get it at, okay? And in all three of those scenarios, that patient may survive, but in one case, it was with a very simple operation. In another case, a very long, complicated operation that put lots of nerves at risk. Even though both patients survived, there's a morbidity difference between those. And so getting things early is a real advantage for the patient, even if there's no difference in survival. Some people, because of these high survival rates, um, they want to call thyroid cancer a good cancer. And it's just crystal clear to me, having spent my lifetime working on this and dealing with patients, there's no such thing as a good cancer. No. <laughs> right? No. Some maybe. are less bad than others. And there's even been some uh, talk about, well, maybe we should not call it cancer. Until we know the difference between the aggressive ones and the not aggressive ones, we need to still call it cancer. Mm -hmm. um, we, we still have to say goodbye to some of our thyroid cancer patients. Um, and my plan as a physician and as a surgeon is to be able to tell a patient, well, listen, we're going we're gonna to do this operation or we're going to do this treatment and then you're going to move on with your life and you're going to have to die of something else way, way later, right? But we're, we're, we're going to work to not let thyroid cancer be the end, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but we can't always say that right now, okay? okay. Um, and so we just have to keep that in mind. For most people, this isn't going to be as serious a thing as those other kinds of bad cancers. Um, and we have to be very, very clear that we make good choices along the way so that we don't have to hear stories about people who have nerve damage or hormone issues or, or lose their life when it could have been a better outcome.